So, in many ways, a broken car is not so different from a disease when the engine is smoking and the lights don't come up. There's a fundamental difference, however, between humans and cars. If I can get my car to a mechanic, I can be pretty certain that they can fix it, which is much more than we can say about many of our diseases today. So why can a mechanic with much less education and much less box than a doctor fix our car while our doctor often let us go with diseases persisting in our body? Well, there are a number of things that actually the mechanic has that the doctor doesn't have right now. First of all, it got the parts list. It has a blueprint telling us how the pieces connect together. It has diagnostic tools to figure out where the comp uh, you know, what, which is broken and what is healthy. And it has means, essentially, to replace the parts. Now, let's think about it. What, which of these components are available to our doctor today? Well, the good news is that they finally got the parts list. That was the outcome of the Human Genome Project. And when the human genome was actually mapped about 10 years ago, we thought it's going to be easy from now. From the parts, we will have essentially the world bonanza that we need to fix us, humans. But, of course, the reality is sinking. We also thought that these many pieces will eventually give us lots of drugs. In 2001, or 2000, the year before the Genome Project was unveiled, the FDA approved about 100 drugs per year. We thought this number could only go up. It could only just increase. Yet the reality sink in. The number of approved drugs essentially in the last 10 years went from 100 before the genome to about 20 per year. In hindsight, the reason is pretty clear. It's not enough to have the parts list. We also need to actually have the, how the pieces fit together. That is, we should not look at this picture, but rather we should be looking at how the wiring diagram of the car looks like, how the wiring diagram of, of our cells actually look like, how the genes and the proteins and the metabolites link to each other, forming a consistent network. Because this network, which I'm going to try to tell you today, is really too key to understanding human diseases. Now, the problem is that if you look at this map, you soon realize that you know, it looks completely random. Randomness certainly has the upper hand, but down the line it is not. I believe that there's a deep order behind, behind this wiring diagram, and understanding that order is the key to understand human diseases. Now, I'm a physicist, and the conventional wisdom is as a physicist I should be studying very big objects, stars, quasars, or very tiny ones like the Higgs boson and quarks. Yet about a decade ago, my interest has turned to a completely different subject, complex systems and networks. And that's because our very existence depends on the successful functioning of systems and networks behind us. And I also believe that the scientific challenges behind complex systems and networks are just as deep as behind quarks or quasars. So I started looking at the structure of the internet telling us how many, many uh, computers are linked together by uh, various cables. I looked at the structure of the social network, telling us how the society is wired together through many friendship and other linkages. And eventually, I started looking at the structure of the cell, telling us you know, how our genes and proteins link to each other into a coherent network. And through that path, I arrived to human diseases a path that is really taken by physicists. Now, the fundamental question that really comes up uh, from that is, you know, how do we think about diseases in the context of these very, very complicated network? And from that, let me turn to a map that we all understand, probably the most famous map out there, which is the map of Manhattan. Now, in many ways, Manhattan is rather different from a, uh, from a cell, but let's for a moment carry with me and let's believe together that this is really not a map of Manhattan, but it's a map of the cell, where the intersections shown as nodes are the genes and the proteins, and the street segments that connect them corresponds to the interactions between them. Now, down the line, you know, this is not so different from what happens in our cells. 
the busy life of Manhattan very easily maps into the crowded life of the cell where molecules interact with each other and recombine and, and, and transport and so on. So there's lots of similarities on the surface between them. And if we look in Manhattan, we also realize that action is not uniformly spread within the city. If you want to go, for example, a theater, you don't go to any parts of Manhattan. You would go to the theater district because that's where most of the theaters are, that's where the shows are. If you want to buy an artwork, you will not be actually going anywhere within the city, but you would be going to the gallery district because there's one small region of the town that has most of the high-end galleries and that's where most artwork is for sale. The same is true in the cell. You know, its functions are not spread uniformly within the network, but there are other pockets within the network that are responsible for particular functions and their breakdown potentially leads to disease. So the way you to think about disease in the context of the network is to think that there are different regions that correspond to different diseases of this map. So for example, you could say that cancer uh, stays somewhere around Wall Street. And, <laughs> and bipolar disease would be somewhere around uh, Times Square. <laughs> and you know, if you think of asthma, a respiratory disease, it would be somewhere up next to the Washington Bridge, you know, where really Manhattan breeds its people and cars into New Jersey and the Bronx. <laughs> now, under normal conditions, Manhattan is full of traffic. And, you know, that's how the cell looks like are normally. But if we have defects, some genes breaking down, that corresponds to some of the intersections not working, and soon enough we will get a very typical Manhattan disease, a traffic jam. This is, again, not so different from what happens in our cells, because there are many different ways you can actually get the same phenotype. In the same ways, there are many different ways you can actually get a disease. For example, there was a famous study by Bert Wolgenstein's group, which, which uh, sequenced about 300 individuals who all had colorectal cancer. They had the same phenotype. So therefore, the expectation was that all of them would have probably the same mutations in the same genes. Yet the study showed that not only they didn't have the same set of mutations, but the mutations were all in different groups of genes. There were no two individuals who would be actually have the same genes exactly, the same group of genes uh, 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 defected. So the only way to understand how is it possible that many different genes broken down in different combinations linked to the same disease is to think, think in terms of Manhattan, is to think in terms of disease module and to really have the wiring diagram of the disease module to understand you know, the breakdown modes of the particular system. Now, if we really believe that particular uh, picture, the next step for us is really to say, well, how do we proceed from here? And it's very easy. Get a map, find a disease module, and drug it. Now, of course, you do realize there's a catch here. And the catch, of course, is that unlike for Manhattan, we don't have yet a map for the, uh, for the cells. I mean, we do. But some of the maps we have are very incomplete. For example, the best protein interaction map we have right now, we believe, we believe that has only 5% of the links that are supposed to be in our cells. Now, having 5% of, 5 of the links means that we're missing 95% of the links. And that has dramatic consequences on the system. Let me illustrate that on Manhattan. Let's go ahead and take 95% of street segments and remove it from the map. And let's see what does it do to Manhattan. And the consequence is obvious. The network will be broken into tiny pieces. And as a result, the modules, the Wall Street neighborhood and Times Square neighborhood that were clearly distinguishable before will be all over the map. You don't know anymore where your disease module is. So what can we do then? Well, first and foremost, we must improve on our maps. And that's what my colleague, uh, Mark Vidal does at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, who in the last 20 years has developed a whole series of automatic tools to systematically map the protein interactions within the cell, one of the very important components of the cellular network. As a result of his work, in about a few years ago, we got what we call the 5% map, the one I referred to earlier. This year, he's about to unveil another landmark, the 20% map of the human cell. And if we let him to stay in truck, so actually, we will, we, he will do the full network. It may take a decade or two to get to it, but eventually, you know, with the effort of his and many others, we will get a map. 
But what until then? Should we just wait for, for him to finish the work? And the answer is, well, not really. There's lots of things we can actually do using the existing maps. So this is how the map looks like right now. This is all the interactions that we leave, we leave should be actually in the cell. And in order to understand how, where disease is lying that, what I'm gonna do next is that I will go ahead and place on this map a particular disease, in this case, asthma. Asthma is a respiratory disease that leads in a, a, a coughing, shortness of breath, and many other symptoms. And there has been a tremendous amount of research understanding the genetic origins of asthma. So therefore, we know about 100 genes that are known to be associated with asthma. So if we put them on the map, and I'm showing them now here as purple nodes, then we would expect them they would be all together, because they really should correspond to our disease module. But they're not. They're all over the map. And the reason why they're over the map is pretty clear, because we are missing 95% of the interactions. So the critical links that would really hold them together in one module are all gone. They're not there yet. So what is that we can do next? Well, we can use the power of the network, that they are really uh, built into the network, and try to figure out other genes who may also be involved in ASVA, who, about whom we don't know yet. And that's exactly what we did next. We took this map and we run algorithm through that that really extract the information from this map and identify what you see in front of your eyes, the asthma module within the cell. Now, if we know the asthma module, from there we can uh, understand the disease mechanism, the disease pathways, and one day can actually help us understand the drugs. But this is not only true for asthma. Not only asthma is located well in within the network. You can take some other diseases, for example, COPD, and try to do the same thing. COPD is often called the smoker's disease because smokers are at very high chance of getting it and has somewhat similar symptoms to asthma. So not surprisingly, the net, the, it seems to be that the two modules are significantly overlapping and they are certainly in the same region of the network. We do expect, however, to have other diseases that would be in a completely different part of the network. And what is crucial here is to understand that the relationship between these diseases, to what degree they overlap and how they relate to each other, is really crucial to understand you know, what is, you know, what, what, how, how they relate to each other and whether, whether they are similar or very different from each other. So one way to look at it is to you know, let's look at the relationship between all diseases. And that's what I'm showing you here. Here, in the next slide, every node corresponds to a, uh, to a particular disease, and two diseases are connected to each other if they share a gene. Why would you do that? Well, because if they share a gene, then very likely their disease module overlaps, and therefore they must be in the same region of the network. And what is amazing about this map is that you see that there are links between completely, apparently unrelated diseases which is telling us that if you really want to kind of treat two, you have two diseases and you want to treat them, today you may go to different doctors, different hospitals, different floors, but down at the level of the cell, they are not independent from each other. They are connected because they are rooted in, somewhat in the same neighborhood. So what this is telling us, this disease on map, I will call it, is that if we want to understand disease, we should not be looking really at the, you know, what we normally look at, but we should be really looking at the network within our cells. This is the one that really matters. This is the one that really should tell us how to classify diseases. You know, we probably got it fundamentally wrong. It's not heart, it's not brains, it's not kidneys. You know, sooner or later we must abandon this organ-based description of the disease and turn to what really matter. We should stop training cardiologists and, and, uh, and uh, neurologists and the rather the doctor of future really needs to become a bit of networkologist to understand where diseases are lying within that network and how they relate to each other. So I personally believe that we need a new medicine to truly execute the paradigm change that genomics allowed us to really achieve. I would call it network medicine. And I think it's really within the, our footstep to really kind of do and achieve that. I also think that Network medicine will not only help us understand the mechanism of disease, but it will affect all aspects of hair care, you know, from the role of the environment all the way to how we actually deliver care to a particular patient. So, coming back to our original question, you know, the good news is that 
doctors are increasingly letting many of the tools that the car mechanics has today. You know, if you think about it, the genomics provides the parts list, metabolomics and proteomics provides diagnostic tools, and gene therapy is really giving us the way to one day to replace the components with, uh, with the pieces that are not broken. But a car mechanic would be useless without a blueprint. And in the same way, I believe that to truly understand diseases, we need to give in the hands of our doctors the map. Now, I'm a physicist and a network scientist. I'm not a medical doctor. Hence, I will never cure any of your diseases. I can help, however, decipher the map, the real book of life, the book that is currently missing most of its pages. But once we learn to read it, we'll get much closer to the secret of life and curing disease. Thank you very much.